Thank you very much. If you, if you want to find that in your Bibles, it'd be helpful because we're going to be kind of dipping in and out of Jonah 3. So just, just find that in your Bibles. If you're not sure where Jonah is and you like to use the kind of the flick method till you spot it, you go past the big prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, you get to Hosea, Amos, and then there's a single page in Obadiah, and then you come to Jonah. So that's Jonah 3. Um, I was... Uh, reading this week, and I came across this story about Thomas Edison, who was a famous inventor, invented lots of things, um, among them the, the, the incandescent light bulb, which is a very important invention. And when he was developing this light bulb, it would take hundreds of hours to manufacture a single bulb in the, in the development phase. And there was one day after finishing a bulb, when he handed it to a young boy, a young errand boy, he had working for him, and he asked him to take it upstairs to the testing room. And so as the boy turned around and he started up the stairs, he stumbled, and the bulb fell, and it shattered. Hundreds of hours of work. Now, you might expect Thomas Edison to be a bit irritated by this, but actually he, he wasn't. Instead of rebuking the boy, well, he may have been inside, but he covered it up very well. He, he, instead of rebuking the boy, he reassured him. And then he turned to his staff, and he told him to start working on another bulb. And that bulb was completed several days later. And when it was completed, Edison walked over to the same boy and handed him the bulb and said, please take this upstairs to the, uh, to the testing room. I mean, imagine how he must have felt at that point, because he knew he didn't really deserve to be trusted with that responsibility again. Um, yet here it was being offered to him again, as though nothing had happened the first time. And actually, that's a real act of grace and that gracious action, what it did, the effect of it was that it, it, it restored this boy to the team very clearly, very fully, and very, very quickly. But that's exactly what God does. That's what God does for us. And it's relevant here in, in the story of Jonah, because what we know about Jonah is, <clears throat> unlike the boy who just made an innocent mistake, Jonah is about willful disobedience. God tells him to go to Nineveh, Jonah goes the other way. He runs away, and then we know what happens. There's a storm and the fish, and he's at the end of chapter 2. In the, while he's in the fish, he prays, comes back to God, and then God commands the fish to vomit him up on the land. I mean, nothing is airbrushed here, is it? And, and we come to chapter 3 with Jonah in a mess. He's in a real mess, and he's, he's been disobedient. And the start of chapter 3 starts with these words. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And we're just going to pause there. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. So I don't want to miss the wonder and the glory of that statement. It's easy just reading it through to completely miss something there. The word of the Lord came to this disobedient, rebellious, reluctant, self-centered person a second time. And, and, and the word of the Lord is not to say, like we might say, look, Jonah, I hope you've learned your lesson now. Now go home, and I'm going to consider whether I can ever use you again, right? But you go home and think about what you've done. Or it's not to say, Jonah, I've noted your concerns, and I've amended my plans to accommodate you, because frankly, I'm desperate, and I've got this job that needs to be done, and I've got no one else to do it. No, no, nothing like that. God's word comes to Jonah a second time to recommission him. It's the same word. He says, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. In his grace, God reinstates Jonah back, right back to where he started, right back to his original purposes for Jonah. And it is pure grace. Because he didn't need to do that. He could have sent somebody else. But his word came to Jonah a second time. Now, we may have written Jonah off. If it was down to us, we may have written him off completely, said, you've blown it, mate, no chance, no way back. In fact, Jonah may have written himself off, kind of thinking, God will never use me again for anything like this. But God restores him. And Scripture is full of examples of people like that, people who make a big mess of things, people who God has chosen, but they get scarred and they make a mess of things, and then God comes and speaks to them a second time. So Abraham, God spoke to Abraham about a son that he was going to have with his wife Sarah. And Abraham believed him, even though it seemed highly unlikely because of their circumstances. It seemed, this seemed impossible, but Abraham believed him. But then time went by, 10 years went by, and nothing has happened. And they start to think, maybe God's not going to come through on this one. We better take matters into our own hands. And so they do. And Abraham has a son, Ishmael, with 
Sarah's maidservant, Hagar. And it's like they've gone off track. They've, they've blown it. You know, they've, gone, they've taken themselves right out of God's purposes. And actually, God was silent for the next 14 or 15 years. But then he spoke to Abraham again. Genesis chapter 17. The word of the Lord came to Abraham a second time. And he says, you will have a son. And you will call him Isaac. It's just grace. Pure grace. Or Moses. Take Moses. You know, we don't know exactly how God speaks to him in his earlier years. But what we do see is Moses feels a sense of destiny to deliver his people from Egypt. But he goes about it at the wrong time in the wrong way. And he kills an Egyptian. And he's got to flee. He's got to go and spend 40 years in the desert looking after sheep. And then it's kind of like God's word comes to him a second time in the burning bush. And it's like, right, now is the time, Moses. Now is when I am sending you. Or Peter. Peter, you know, the one who declared vigorously that I will never abandon you. I would never disown you, Jesus. I will die with you if necessary. And then days later, we see him just cursing and swearing three times that he never knew the man. And you just think, Peter, you've really blown it. There's, there, surely there can't be any way back for Peter now, but there is. It's not the end for Peter, because Jesus re- reinstates him. In that amazing scene where he asked him three times to counter the three denials, three times, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And the word of the Lord came a second time. Peter's restored, and you notice Jesus doesn't just forgive him, and sort of say, and then Peter's just kind of in among the crowd. He reinstates him. He's the leader. He's there on the day of Pentecost at the front of the crowd, preaching the gospel boldly, boldly proclaiming the name of Jesus, who he had denied just weeks earlier. 3,000 people responding to this message. The word of the Lord comes a second time. It's what he does. It's his persistent grace. Now, I remember when I was a very new Christian, so I was 17, maybe just 18 years old, and... I was just excited about everything, just about this new life that was opening up in front of me and everything involved with it and the the possibilities and being used by God and doing things for God, all that kind of thing. It was just exciting. And I remember at that time being down at a church in Horsham where Colin Urquhart, who was the, the leader of the church, prayed for me. And I can't exactly remember if it was at the same time or at different times, but I remember two things that he prayed for me. One was about a gift of teaching and the other was about boldness. And I remember him just praying and just, just saying boldness like that and feeling the surge of something running through me. I think I may have kind of fallen over as well at the time, but gift of teaching, boldness. And I was just full at that time of the possibilities of what I could do for God, of what God could do in me, of revival in the nation, all of that kind of thing. And I do remember having a very bold conversation with a member of my family, um, one that I would never normally have, but it was something along the lines of, Um, we're all going to die someday, and I'm worried that you won't know Jesus when you do. (sighs) You know, I don't have that sort of conversation with members of my family. It was bold, and actually his response was, no, it's all right, it's okay, I'm not going to die. And I said, well, actually, you are, because we all are. The point is, my concern is that you won't know Jesus when it happened, and there wasn't really much further response after that. But it was boldness, that kind of reckless boldness, that reckless enthusiasm to see Jesus lifted high, to see his name made known, excitement, being in the purposes of God and pursuing them with everything I had. But then I also remember going to school and realizing that people might think I was a bit weird if I talked about Jesus there. And then on to university where the need to fit in and be popular and be acceptable to other people outweighed the desire to be bold and the desire to live for God. And so I drifted into a lifestyle that was far from pleasing to God. And it kind of felt a bit like Jonah, that God had set a course for my life. Teaching, boldness, he had set the course. And I was drifting in precisely the opposite direction. And then I got a phone call from uh, somebody called Stuart Morris, who many of you will know. Stuart used to be here at King's, um, up in Bradford now with his wife Gaynor and daughter Natalie. And he phoned me and he was asking me if I wanted, when I finished university later that year, if I wanted, if I'd be interested in doing a year with the church, working for the church for a year. And for me, that was like the word of the Lord came a second time. Time to stop running. Time to turn around. And that year 
was an absolutely pivotal time in my life of getting back on track with God, getting back into his purposes for my life and pursuing them. But what about you? What about you? Are you still as excited about the purposes of God in your life as maybe you once were? Are you pursuing that with everything that you have or are you running in the opposite direction? Are you drifting? Have you taken a detour? Are there things that you have vowed to God in the past that you're no longer pursuing? Are there things that he has said to you that maybe he's promised to you that you're no longer hoping in, that you're no longer living for? Because you know what? God doesn't forget vows that you have made to him. And he doesn't forget promises that he has made to you. So pick them up again. Pick those things up again. If there are things which have been lost in the past, pick them up again and and do it today. Or maybe you feel like, actually, I've made such an almighty mess of my life. I've messed it up. I've made such a mess that you've disqualified yourself from the purpose of God. You've, you've disqualified yourself and there's no way back. But let me tell you something very clearly. If that's what you think, if that's what you believe, if you believe you've disqualified yourself, if you believe there's no way back, that is a lie that comes straight from the pit of hell. It is a deception. It is not true. It is absolutely not true. Because do you know what? You don't even get to disqualify yourself, actually. You don't even have the right to do that. Because when, even when you've backslidden, even when you're hiding from God, even when you find yourself in the mire of moral failure, in the mire of sin, God will continue to unfold his plan for your life. You don't get to stop that. The Bible is littered with people who do this, who mess up and then are reinstated because God speaks to them a second time. The word of the Lord comes a second time. His grace is absolutely persistent, and I thank God that that is true, and that that is true in my life, and I know it's true in many lives here today. And he may be calling you to repent if you're in that position. If you're in a mess, he doesn't intend for you to go on living in mess indefinitely. He wants you back. He wants you back running in the right direction. He wants you back pursuing his purposes for your life. And he may lead you into a place where you have to repent, where you have to acknowledge the sin that has entangled you, and you have to submit to him again. You've got to commit your life to God again, just like Jonah found himself in the belly of a fish, in the darkness, absolutely desperate, nowhere else to go except come back to God. Because we have a God who restores. It's what he does. This is a a loving father who restores and reinstates. He helps us to regain ground that we have lost. He restores the years that the locusts have eaten. This is the God who commanded the fish to vomit Jonah up onto land. I mean, just think about that for a minute. God commanded the fish. There's nothing he can't command. You think you're in too deep a pit to be lifted out? Do you think you've run too far? You've done too much? That you're in too much of a mess that there's no way out? God commanded the fish. God commanded the walls of Jericho to fall. He commanded lions not to bite and fire not to burn. He commanded the Red Sea to open and it opened. He can do anything. He can do absolutely anything. He can bring you back. That's not beyond him. Nothing is beyond him. You can never be too far away. You can never, there's no mess that is too big for God to reach in and lift you out and set your feet back on that solid rock of Jesus Christ again. So come back to him if that's you. Come back today. Don't delay. Don't think I'll do that tomorrow once I've sorted a few things out. Come back to him today. Because it says the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. And this time it says that Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and he went to Nineveh. And he went immediately. There's no hint of a rest. You know, God doesn't say, Jonah, I'm just going to give you a week off to recover so you can just wash some of that stomach acid off you and, you know, it's a little bit gross and get yourself in shape. No, no, he's just go now. This is the mission I've given you. Now go. Go immediately. Do as you're told, Jonah. And it's the same for us. Come back to him now. Don't delay. Don't wait till tomorrow. Come back to him. Get into his purposes. It's the same God. It's the same prophet. And it's the same mission. 
And it's the same for us because his command to us has never changed. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. It's the same command. And he promises to be with us in that. Surely I am with you even to the very end of the ages, right at the end of Matthew. Same command. And what an opportunity we have. Just think, King's Church, where God has placed us. He's placed us, first of all, in the center of this town. When we moved here 20 on years ago, this, really, this actually wasn't particularly the center of town. Now it is. It's moved. He's placed us here. He's placed us in a place of influence, a place where the nations come to us. It's amazing. And now he's also placing us in another community, in Hazelmere. He's opened a door for us up there, just as he's opened many doors for us in the past. And who knows in the future where he may open further doors and other communities for us to impact, for us to to be part of. But the command is the same. Wherever we are, go and make disciples. Go and make disciples in High Wycombe. Go and make disciples in Hazelmere. Go and make disciples in the university. Go and make disciples in your school. The command is the same. Why? Because God loves the people of High Wycombe. He loves this town. It says in verse 3 in the story that Nineveh was a, a very important city. Now that doesn't just mean that it was important strategically, which it was, or that it was important in size, which it also was, but that it was important to God. This brutal, violent city was important to God. God loves this utterly godless world capital, and he loves the people in it. He hates what they do. He hates the sin. He hates the violence, the brutality, the corruption. He hates that with a passion, but his heart burns for them, unlike his prophet Jonah, who hates the Assyrians. That's why he doesn't want to share the message. That's why he's so reluctant, because he's afraid that they will respond. He hates the Assyrians. He doesn't want to preach the message to them because of fear and because of prejudice. But that should cause us to ask questions of ourselves as Christians. What is our heart attitude towards Muslims or towards immigrants or towards criminals or towards the homeless or even towards militant atheists? Those who maybe we see as unreachable or in some cases maybe we see as undesirable. Those maybe who we approach with a sense of superiority. These are people God loves. He loves them. He loves the people of High Wycombe. And so we are to love them too, with everything we have. So what stops us? What stops us doing that? What stops us sharing the message of Jesus, telling people about the gospel, telling people about Jesus, the greatest, the greatest thing we could ever do for anybody The most kind thing we could ever do for anybody. What stops us doing that? Awkwardness, probably, sometimes. Fear, certainly. Fear of rejection. Fear of offending other people. And maybe sometimes it is to do with prejudice and to do with a lack of love. But I think also it's to do with the fact that maybe we just don't expect God to work through us. Through through what we can bring. Maybe other people... You know, there are some people who are really good at this evangelism thing, and they're good at they know. I never know what to say, you know. But just look at the sermon that Jonah preached in Nineveh. I find this very encouraging. Because Jonah said in Nineveh, he goes in, blurts out, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. That's it. I mean, he may have said other things, but that's all we get. That's all we know. It's all the Bible tells us. An eight-word sermon of pure judgment. There's no repentance. There's no offer of repentance. There's no grace here. There's no, you know, listen guys, God really loves you. He wants the best for you, but he's really not happy with your life choices at the moment. So turn around and come to him. No, 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 none of that. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. And you look at that and you think, Jonah, what are you doing? That is not how you do evangelism. You're not going to win anybody with that message. You're going to put people off. Actually, it's a bit embarrassing. You give God's people a bad name. What are you doing? God's not going to do anything with a message like that. And it turns out to be the most successful evangelistic sermon ever preached because 120,000 people respond to this message. It goes viral without the aid of YouTube or Twitter or Facebook. It's just good old-fashioned word of mouth, and it even reaches to the royal courts. Let's read what happened. I'm going to read from verse 4 to the end of the chapter. On the first day, Jonah started into the city, and he proclaimed, 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. 
The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. And then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. I mean, this is repentance. Even the animals are included in this. This is, this is true repentance. And then the king says, who knows? Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. I mean, that's incredible. The response, that is an incredible miracle. You know, let alone the fish and all of that. This The response of these people is incredible. Then it takes a step even further. Because it says, When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion on them. He did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. It's amazing. Simply amazing. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overturned. That's all Jonah had. And it sparked a massive revival. It's just repentance en masse. And while his eight-word sermon of judgment may not be a model for us of how we are to preach and how we are to speak to others about Jesus, what it does demonstrate is how God can work through the most flawed message and through the most flawed messenger. Because note what it says. It says the people believed God. They didn't believe Jonah. It says the Ninevites believed God. God. This is God's work. This is God's power at work in something we would probably look at and think, you know what? Who would expect anybody to act on that? Who would expect anybody to respond to that message? But maybe we carry those same low expectations of God's ability to work through even flawed messages into our own feeble attempts at times to talk to others about Jesus and tell the gospel. You know, probably one of the worst jobs I ever had it lasted for about a week. It, Actually, it was precisely a week. And it was going door to door, trying to interest people in UPVC fascias and soffits and cladding. And it was soul-destroying, because you know nobody wants to talk to you. Nobody wants you at their door. And so I would find myself approaching a front door, thinking, please don't be in. Please don't be in. I can tick the box and move on. And if somebody is in, you're just kind of like, oh, um, not trying to sell you anything. I uh, just want to see if you're interested in talking to somebody about by which time the door has closed in your face. And your message gets more and more apologetic. Kind of, I'm really, really sorry to bother you. Um, I'm not trying to sell you anything. Just want to see if you're interested, and you're probably not, but just in case you are interested in you PVC face, thank you very much. I'm, and you're walking off down the path until that one occasion where somebody says, actually, no, I am. I, I've been thinking about having that done. Sorry? You're interested in talking. Okay. But I think sometimes we can be a bit like that with the gospel and with opportunities that come along to talk about it. You know, um, you, know you, you might say something, oh, you're, probably, you're probably not interested, but um, just wondering if you wanted to come to my, my church on Sunday, on Easter Sunday, there'll be a children's thing. You, I know you're very busy. You're probably not interested. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Or, or when somebody asks you what you did at the weekend and you're sort of thinking, the weekend... Um, Oh, what did I do? Uh, Sunday, Sunday. I went to church in the morning. And, oh, in the evening, uh, we had friends over, and it was great. We played loads of games, and it was, it was fantastic. And you kind of brush it under the carpet, and we can approach these things with low expectations and almost an apologetic manner, as if we're somehow imposing on someone, even though the gospel is genuinely good news. It is the best news we could ever share with anybody. It's the best gift we could give to anybody. It is far better news than new PVC fascias and soffits, okay? Believe me on that. What did you do this weekend? Actually, Sunday morning I was at church, and I've got to tell you about it, because it was amazing, because, you've got, in fact, you've got to come, you, because God's presence, you've just got to come and experience it yourself. I can't describe it. But how persuaded are we of what we believe? How persuaded are we of that? How persuaded are we of the power of the gospel and the power of God to work through even you and your and my feeble efforts? 
at telling people about Jesus. And I do address this massively to myself this morning. I heard a really encouraging story just this week on Tuesday. So it's Phil, uh, Phil Gray, who, who uh, is a member of the church. He, he works from our office sometimes, works uh, on New Frontiers events. So New Frontiers is the, the, the family of churches we belong to. Uh, and Phil particularly works on New Day, the summer festival which our youth get loads from. Uh, anyway, he was in Amsterdam last weekend with a group of people organizing events which went around the launch of a church plant in, in, in Amsterdam, in that city. And they were all out on Saturday night. It was somebody's birthday in the group. And they were having dinner. And so this guy, whose birthday it was, went up to a waiter and said, it's my birthday today, and it's really special to me. It's really exciting, because actually it was six years ago on my birthday that I became a Christian, and God came into my life, and he changed everything. I'm just so grateful, and I'd really like to pray for you. You know, I'd probably be sitting there at this point going, oh my goodness. (laughs) Not with me, not with me. Um, And I think the waiter was fairly bemused by all this, but anyway, they prayed for him and then moved on, moved on with the evening. I thought nothing more of it. Then a bit later, a lady came over who was the owner of the restaurant, and she said to them, you know, I noticed what, you you know, I saw what happened earlier. And um, she proceeded to tell them that she had a kind of a church background, but she, basically, she had fallen away from God, and she hadn't been to church in years, and she had never found a church in Amsterdam that was right, and all of that sort of thing, and could you please pray for me? Wow. So they end up praying for this lady, Uh, and then she goes on to tell them how she really likes Hillsong. She likes the music from Hillsong, and Phil, as he does, is carrying around a New Day CD in his bag, which he pulls out and says, well, you might like some of the music on here, and actually some of these songs are like the songs that we sing in our churches, and by the way, we're launching a church plant in Amsterdam tomorrow, if 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 you're interested. So the next morning, this lady turns up with her husband and daughter, the whole family come, and during the meeting, someone brought a word of knowledge. And it hit the nail on the head for her. And she broke down in tears and that day recommitted her life to Christ. Now, who knew that that was going to happen? Who expected that? They certainly didn't expect it, that praying for this waiter would lead to this chain of events that results in this woman recommitting her life to Christ and who knows where her, what will happen with her family. No one expected that. Who can predict what God will do when one of his people takes a step of boldness, when one of his people will, take, will step out in response to a prompting of the Holy Spirit, even though you might not understand it and you might not find it very easy to do, who knows what God will do? Who can predict what he will do? It's not our job to predict, actually. It's our job to be obedient. And what this really comes down to is love. It's all about love and compassion. And how much do we share the love and compassion that overflows from God for this world. How much do we share in that? In the Jonah story, first of all, you see God's wrath and you see God's judgment that is righteously directed at Nineveh just as it is righteously directed at this world today. Yes, yeah, God's wrath, God's judgment. Make no mistake about it, God is fiercely angry with the sin in the world, with the corruption in the world, with the evil in the world. And that includes the sin and evil and corruption that resides in you and me. God's wrath, God's judgment. We can sometimes shy away from mentioning anything like that because it's not a very popular message, but to do so dilutes the gospel. Because without that coming judgment of God, without the bad news, the gospel is no gospel at all. It's not good news. Why would it be good news? The good news of the gospel is what we are being saved from and the life that we are being saved for through no merit of our own, purely by his grace. And what comes through strikingly in this story, but only because we know what is coming, only because we know the judgment of God that is coming upon that city, what comes through strikingly is when God relents and his compassion is shown. We see that he has this desperate desire that all would be saved. And the same applies to us and our world today. God desires that all would be saved by turning to him and trusting in him. God aches to show compassion. That's who he is. We are in the unbelievably blessed position of knowing that, of knowing God's compassion, of having experienced it firsthand, and with the task of telling the world about it. Because in the story, the Ninevites hoped that God would show compassion. They hoped he would be gracious. They didn't know. They had no certainty. They had no guarantees. The king says, who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so we will not perish. 
The Ninevites hoped that he would be compassionate. Jonah pretty much knew he would be, which was his problem, really. But we can be certain of it. We are certain of God's compassion. We can be certain of God's grace. Why? Because we are in the position of having seen the one who he appointed to be the judge of the world bleeding on a cross for the world, for his enemies, Jesus, the one who called himself the greater Jonah, who didn't just spend three days in the belly of a fish. He spent three days in the darkness and stench of death, in a tomb, devoured by death before rising to swallow up death for us. He bleeds compassion for the world. He bleeds compassion for the world. He bleeds compassion for every single one of us here today. And he calls us to love others as he has loved us. That's quite a calling. To love others as Jesus has loved us. But what you see in the story is that this God who can do anything, he can do anything. He sends the storm. He sends the fish at just the right time, just the right place. He commands the fish to vomit Jonah up. Just anything to get his prophet to where he needs him to be. This God who can do anything. But one thing he absolutely will not do is save Nineveh without a messenger. Without someone going and speaking. And in Romans 10, Paul says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that is absolutely true. And for some here this morning, you've got to do that. You've got to call on the name of the Lord. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Without someone proclaiming this message to them? And he goes on to say, faith comes from hearing the message. Faith comes from hearing the message. You may have heard a a phrase quite popular in Christian circles, which goes something like this. It says, always preach the gospel and sometimes use words. Have you heard that before? You know, and we know what it means. We know it means you know, your life, your lifestyle should be a living demonstration, a living communication of the gospel. And that's absolutely right. But words are essential. Words, speaking, are absolutely essential. And it's like God says to Paul in, in the book of Acts, in Acts 18. This is very familiar to us. God says, do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. I have many people in this city. Now that's a word which for us has a lot of weight prophetically. It's been spoken over us as a church many times. You know, do not be silent, keep on speaking. I have many people in this place. And Greg Haslam says, in the babble of human philosophies and confused ideologies, our world is desperate for the beautiful message of salvation, spoken out in truth, love, and clarity by chosen men and women of God. If people do not hear it, how will they believe it? Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus. You don't follow Jesus. That's just not part of your life or hasn't been up to now. Well, hear his message for you this morning. This afternoon even. Hear his message for you. His message to you is turn to me. Repent. Stop pursuing sinful things. Stop going your own way and thinking you can sort out everything in life yourself. You can't. Repent. Turn around. Come to me. Because you can't save yourself. Only he can do that. So come to Christ. And come now. Call out to him. Call on his name now, today. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to help you. Ask him to carry you. Ask him to save you. And you will find that God never, ever refuses that kind of prayer. Because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Do it today. And for those of us who are Christians, we have the greatest message ever. We have a message of hope for a dying world. Jesus called us the light of the world. We are, we are to be light in the darkness, so let us be that. Let's be light in the darkness. And it may be that you feel disqualified, that, you've, that there's no way back, that you've gone too far. Well, uh, let God speak to you a second time. Let the word of the Lord come to you a second time. Come back to him. And again, don't delay. Do it today. Do it now. Don't delay. And you may feel reluctant. You may feel inadequate. Well, join the club. And look at Jonah. God chose to besiege this great city of Nineveh with an army of one. But first he had to besiege that one, that person, Jonah. But through everything, through that process, through everything that Jonah went through and that God led him through, God turned him into a world changer. 
albeit a reluctant one. But he was a world changer. He did something, God used him for something absolutely remarkable. But if God can do that with one person, what can he do with 700 people who come here on a Sunday morning? Ask him to work in you. Ask him to transform you. Ask him to change you. Ordinary people changed by Jesus to change the world. Do you believe it? Do you believe that he can use you to change the world? It's his calling on your life. On all of us, it's his calling on our lives. And if you let him, he will turn you into a world changer. And he will use everything in that. He will use everything you've gone through in your life. All the experiences you've had, the good experiences and the bad experiences, every single scar that you carry, every episode in your life that you looked at and thought, what was that for? What was that about? Well, God will use it to turn you into someone who can change the world with the gospel. Just think what God can do with 700 world changers. See, Jonah spoke the message, but the Ninevites believed God. They believed God. Ordinary people can hear God speaking through your very ordinary words. So do you pray? Do you pray for opportunities to share the message of Jesus with other people? Do you pray for him to put people in your path that you can speak to, opportunities to arise? Praying for people who just he puts on your heart. Do you pray for those things? Because if God can use Jonah to save a city, he can certainly use you in High Wycombe. He can certainly use you in Hazelmere, in your university, in your school. He can certainly use you. He can use you and he will use you if you ask and if you are willing. So the question really is, will you ask and are you willing?